Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about upfront diagnosis of ALL and immunotherapy of ALL in two separate talks. For the first talk, we're going to go over diagnosis and risk stratification of ALL management and monitoring response to treatment as well as risk adapted treatment. I don't have to tell this audience how to do a bone marrow biopsy, but um, the diagnosis of ALL will be made, um, is made by uh, looking at the morphology, immunophenotype, and cytogenetics uh, of importance. Under the molecular subcategory, it's important to recognize PCR able positive or Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL, as well as FISH for any recurrent genetic abnormalities that are present in newly diagnosed ALL. And here's the spectrum of cytogenetic abnormalities in ALL. Um, adult ALL, uh, translocation 922 or the Philadelphia chromosome is present in about 20 to 30 percent and is associated with poor risk. So is translocation 411. Deployed um, karyotype is the other major subcategory of uh, cytogenetics in ALL. I would like to draw attention to um, BCR able like ALL. So these are patients who do not have the Philadelphia chromosome, but the presence of this, um, these fish um, um, positive uh, uh, genes, IKZF1, CRLF1, um, and PDGFR, these are all associated with response to um, TKIs uh, and generally make up 10 to 12 percent of uh, B cell ALL and are associated with poor risk. It is not standard of care yet to um, combine chemotherapy with TKIs, but it's important to recognize this as a subcategory. To make it simpler, the cytogenetics in ALL is divided into poor risk and good risk. Poor risk is any patient who has a hypodiploid 11q23922 complex karyotype chromosomes, and rest of all are good risk. When we look at, when we look at patients, um, their and the presentation based on the age, the clinical features, as well as their response to treatment, patients can be divided into standard risk and adverse risk uh, for ALL. Adverse risk are older patients over 60, with the high white cell counted diagnosis, a mature T cell phenotype, the poor risk cytogenetic classification that we talked about, having a minimal residual disease, which is more than 1% at the end of induction, time to response, or more than four weeks, or needing more than one cycle to go into remission. You can see how, what the standard risk um, um, looks like. They're usually under 35 years old. Practically, though, when, you, um, when we're looking at patients, it is important to classify based on age and Philadelphia chromosome because the upfront treatment will change. Um, identifying young adults, adolescents and young adults, the age group is considered up to 40 years. Uh, the treatment might be different. I'm going to talk about that later. And also the presence and absence of Philadelphia chromosome will also change the upfront management of ALL. Before we go into the individual treatments, I would like to bring forward the concept of minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease. Um, it is measured with, via two uh, ways, um, flow cytometry and PCR. PCR is particularly relevant for BCR able positive um, ALL. And it's very important um, uh, to measure MRD in patients who are going, undergoing treatment because as you can see in the slides, that MRD is important in every sub, at every point that you can measure it. On day 29, patients who are MRD negative enjoy an 88% long-term survival, while it's 30% for those who are not. As early as day eight in peripheral blood also, MRD is shown to have prognostic significance um, for ultimate cure. And so is end of consolidation marrow. If you look at the overall survival of patients with ALL, standard risk, the long-term survival is about 40 to 50 percent, and the high risk under 25 percent. However, if you look at patients who are undergoing MRD testing, and if they achieve MRD negative status, then you can see that the standard and the high risk are pretty, uh, curves are pretty superimposable, suggesting that 
having a good response to treatment in the form of an MRD negative um, remission is important. Um, and maybe we're moving away from the high risk versus standard risk and going towards more treatment um, changes or uh, based on MRD um, response. The basic principles of ALL therapy consists of three phases. The first one is induction, which um, multimodality chemotherapy is used for uh, usually anthracyclines, asparaginase, ARC, cytoxin, rentgristin, and prednisone. And there's a phase of consolidation or intensification that lasts generally about seven months, followed by maintenance for two to three years. Maintenance is with 6-MP um, methotrexate, rentgristin steroids, and TKIs in Philadelphia-positive ALL. We'll talk about the Philadelphia positive separately. It's very important that CNS prophylaxis be done in patients with ALL. They are, everybody who has a diagnosis of ALL has to have a baseline LP. And even though there is no disease, prophylaxis is warranted because all patients, generally most patients, will relapse in the CNS without intensive CNS prophylaxis. Earlier, cranial irradiation was part of regimens for CNS prophylaxis, but now data has suggested that I just intrathecal chemotherapy with methotrexate um, um, and or cytarabine is uh, as good, and it uh, takes away the toxicity of CNS pro prophylaxis via cranial irradiation. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but the point I'm making here is that in adult patients over 40 years with Philadelphia negative ALL, the NCCN guidelines basically say clinical trial or multi-agent chemotherapy. There is no one recommended, um, recommended regimen that is a, a favorite or a standard. And here are all the regimens that are, um, that are equally efficacious. There is no head-to-head -head trial between any of these regimens, but they all have been associated with about 40% long-term uh, um, survival in um, a mixed bag of patients who can actually undergo chemotherapy. Among these, I wanted to draw the differences between the two regimens that are a little bit different. The first one is hyper-CVAD, which is basically um, alternating regimens of A and B cycles, A being the um, uh, cy you know, cytoxin and anthracycline-based induction, and B being methotrexate and ARAC, and it Patients undergo four total cycles of A and B combined, while the second part, which is the what is traditionally called the Larsen regimen, has an induction, intensification, and interim maintenance and prophylaxis. And uh, later on, uh, both uh, treatments undergo maintenance for about two to three years. And again, there are no head-to-head -head trials to compare one versus the other, but they are um, interchangeably used. In patients who are younger, um, that is under 40 years, NCCN guidelines recommend clinical trial or pediatric-inspired multi-agent chemotherapy. So I would like to go a little bit detailed um, on why there is this difference. So young adults and older adults are different for a lot of reasons. First is the disease biology. Older patients have more complex um, cytogenetics and generally more high-risk uh, cytogenetics. And there's also a host um, factor here. There's organ dysfunctions, drug metabolism, resistant genes are all um, found to be dysregulated in older patients. And interestingly, the treatment as well. Um, one aspect of treatment is that the younger the children or the adolescent um, are generally compliant because their parents are actually taking them on time, while the older pa patients tend to be, you know, there might be some delays uh, with, uh, with the treatments. And also uh, chemotherapy differences and uncomfortably maybe physician differences because we maybe as adult oncologists, we tend to give them a little break um, while the, young, you know, the pediatric oncologists would say, it's New Year's Eve, Chemo starts today. So if you look at um, young adult patients across all trials and, and, and compare the same age group in patients who were treated with uh, children's regimens or pediatric regimens 
or the adult regimen, you can see that the event-free survival at five years is astonishingly different. Um, the first one being the children's and the second one being the adult between the each individual regimen. So 64 versus 38, 67 versus 41, this is, you know, um, this is how this whole concept evolved that perhaps the young adults have to be treated like pediatric patients. And there are subtle differences between, um, between these regimens. The pediatric regimens require or have a much higher doses of asparaginase, vincristin, and steroids, while lower doses of cytoxin and anthracyclines, which are more cytotoxic. There is usually more aggressive CNS-directed therapy. Um, there's capizimethotrexate, which basically means escalating methotrexate um, over time. Um, there is a phase of late intensification um, in pediatric regimens. Lesser use of stem cell transplant. Um, and also males get longer maintenance than females because the risk of relapse in boys is, is higher than, um, than girls. And also a dose adjustment during maintenance um, to make sure that the white cell count, the neutrophil count, is not uh, uh, very normal. It has to be kept a little bit low normal. And as we talk about this, the biggest issue comes with pediatric regimens is the use of pegasparaginase, because intensive use of pegasparaginase has its own set of toxicity. The, three, uh, the four major things that has to be looked out for these patients is, first is the LFT abnormalities. These patients, um, are very, it's very common to have hyperbilirubinemia and LFT abnormalities, and they persist because pegasparaginase um, tends to be in the system for about a month since when you infuse it. And many times these start at the time of discharge when the neutrophils have already recovered. So it's very important to monitor these patients for the LFT abnormality. The big, big problem is pancreatitis, although it is not very common. The, if a patient has pancreatitis from pegasparaginase, that usually precludes the use of it again because generally when you use it again, it will happen again and it can impact the morbidity and mortality. Thrombosis is also very common in patients with pegasparaginase. Um, we generally use full-dose anticoagulation prophylactically to prevent it, but several trials have um, done it differently. Some patients have the clot first, and then um, the anticoagulation begins. It is there was, a, there was a study done um, with the DFCI regimen that even if there is thrombosis, um, you can successfully give enough pegasparaginase um, in follow-up um, at least up to 80% of the dose, which is like the marker of, of increasing and decreasing efficacy, that if you can give up to 80% of the intended pegasparaginase dose, that is an actual impact on, um, on uh, cure rates. Infusion reactions are also um, common with pegasparaginase. All they, it is standard to use uh, steroids um, prior, and if there are antibodies that do appear, um, it warrants a switch to the Irvinia pegasparaginase um, as an alternative. So the question comes as what age is considered young for these pediatric-inspired regimens? Because you know, some, it's some, some trials have looked at up to 30, some trials up to 25, some trials up to 50. So this was a trial um, that the Germans um, um, did, which actually went, used the pediatric-inspired regimen up to age 60. And as you can see that the uh, patients between up to age 45 um, had superior survival, but more importantly, the bottom two curves of non relapse mortality was higher for the age group of 46 to 60 with a pediatric um, regimen, while the 15 to 45 age group did um, pretty okay. So currently, up to 40 is considered safe for this pediatric-inspired regimen. From 40 to 45, there is still some debate, and individual decisions have to be made based on how the um, patient is doing and, and the performance status. Um, there are several of these uh, this um, pH negative uh, adult uh, um, pediatric inspired um, regimens. Uh, again, no head to head controls, but they all uh, perform similarly. So these are the prospective studies of pediatric like regimens in adults, and you can see that all of these um, have an event free survival with pretty high, 60 to 63 at six years, 77, 60. I'm um, suggesting that these um, these regimens are doing. Uh, the better even in the prospective um, settings. 
Um, I would like to call upon this trial, which was recently completed, and we're currently awaiting the full results, but CLGB-10403 was an inspired pediatric-inspired regimen, um, which was used in patients from age 16 to 30, um, and used the same uh, inten induction intensification maintenance uh, um, regimen. The early studies, uh, the early results of it uh, have shown about 60% um, um, long-term survival with 80 months, and the reason I bring this up is that there was minimal transplant um, with this um, regimen, and this has been used as a backbone for many of these combination um, treatments that are um, coming forward with the intent of uh, uh, not doing a transplant if they're MRD negative. Moving on to Philadelphia positive ALL. So traditionally, P Philadelphia positive ALL was the bad child of ALL. Um, patients did extremely poorly. Uh, Long-term survival was you know, 10 to 20 percent. And then when um, Gleevec came around, um, th there was uh, a big uh, study from the UK group that looked at imatinib with multimodality chemotherapy. And the long-term survival at 10 years um, compared to the pre-imatinib era, this is not a randomized study, but a, a historical co um, cohort showed that it was, um, it was superior to include imatinib uh, in combination with um, um, uh, the uh, chemotherapy. And also giving imatinib early was important as well, 40% um, long-term um, cure rate compared to 26% when it was incorporated late after induction. Um, and pre-imatinib, as you can see, it's 19%. But we have an embarrassment of riches to some extent now with Philadelphia positive ALL. We have a lot of other TKIs, disatinib, nilotinib, basutinib, and panatinib. And who is going to be the winner in this game is yet to be uh, discovered. Here are all the combination treatments that have looked at upfront ALL uh, in uh, combination with um, chemotherapy plus a TKI. Um, there was a trial um, with nilotinib, which showed 72% uh, overall survival at 24 months. You can see the CR rate was 91% um, with a CMR rate, of, uh, which is complete molecular rate, of 77%. Disatinib has been combined with hyper-CVAD from the MD Anderson group. And again, long-term, um, uh, the CR rates was 96 and 88% um, for two different studies with long-term survival of 46 um, at 60 months and 69 at 36 months, which are pretty good for a Philadelphia um, chromosome positive ALL. Interestingly, this was um, a study by FOA was actually just using um, disatinib with prednisone without chemotherapy and the survival was still 69% at 20 months, which is going towards the era of can you reduce chemotherapy in patients with, um, um, uh, with Philadelphia positive ALL in the TKI um, era. Uh, Ponatinib is the new kid on the block with this. 100% um, um, CR rate in uh, 64 patients. Uh, with a survival of 78% at 36 months. The problem with um, panatinib is there has been an association of um, thrombotic complications, and on this trial also about 19% of um, patients developed it. So one strategy is to use it at a higher dose up front and then later on uh, um, drop it in maintenance. But again, these are all part of clinical um, trials, and it is um, not standard yet to combine panatinib with the uh, with the chemotherapy. The issue with second generation TKIs or TKIs in, in general um, with chemotherapy is that there are late relapses. And these relapses are happening because of a resistant clone, um, generally the T315I um, clone. And it is yet to see if upfront use of panatinib can actually um, prevent that from happening. Um, at an acceptable toxicity. There are ongoing trials using a chemo-free regimen of blinitumumab with disatinib or panatinib, and also inotuzumab with basutinib um, uh, to see if uh, you can combine chemo uh, uh, immunotherapy with um, TKIs and perhaps avoid um, chemotherapy in uh, patients with Philadelphia positive ALL. <laughs> I will not spend too much time on the T cell subtype. Everything that I spoke so far was B cell ALL. T cell ALL is, ALL is not treated dramatically different than B cell ALL. The same strategies apply. Young patients go for pediatric inspired regimens, and older patients um, go with some multimodality treatment, um, with the uh, exception that patients with big thymic masses uh, are radiated after the completion of. Uh, 
their um, chemotherapy. The uh, long-term responses are, are similar, the except for the thymic one, which is very favorable. I would like to end with this slide um, that on the left side you can see the pediatric um, patients that over the years their survival has gone from 21% to about 90% long-term survival and on the right is our adults where there has been improvement but at a very, very excruciatingly slow pace. So. We hope that with the advent of um, new regimens, the pediatric-inspired regimens, um, as well as the combination of TKI with chemotherapy and the combination of immunotherapy um, with pediatric-inspired um, regimens, uh, would help us get, bridge this gap. Um, it is very important um, to incorporate this universal MRD measurement to guide the treatment and guide the optimal use of um, stem cell um, transplant in these patient, uh, patients, and hopefully we'll catch up with our pediatric colleagues on it. Thank you for your time.